Black Live. Uh, longtime friend first, and uh, jo Josh and I have known each other for years. Josh Helmholt needs no introduction. Rivals.com uh, uh, recruiting analyst handles uh, certainly specific to where Purdue is as much as anything. And Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us today. It's been a, just a walk in the park week for you, I'm sure. <laughs> it's an interesting week, fellow. You know, the culmination of a very interesting year. Yeah, it is. Uh, and getting we, we, we don't want it to get any more interesting here in the next two weeks uh, or next uh, 10 days or however long we have in 2020. But uh, been amazing from that standpoint. All right. Uh, Purdue gets 14 commitments in its class. Jeff Brahms, uh, I guess this would be his fifth class, all told, really, when you get right down to it. Not ranked very high. Uh, obviously, I think in the, at least in the rivals ranking in the Big Ten 13th, only ahead of Illinois. Uh, what do you take of that if you're a Purdue fan? Obviously, a small class size as well, only 14 commits, but uh, your overall impressions of the class. Well, if you're a Purdue fan, you just signed two top 30 classes the last two years. Now to come back with a team that I think ranks outside the top 75, both quantity and quality is lacking in the class. So that's a concern, obviously. You don't want to ever have that one, you know, a year that you dip because then you have to compensate for that later in the process. And this is a year that they have certainly dipped in terms of restocking the cover. Uh, obviously grabbing Yanni Karlaftis at the end was big, but he was a guy obviously Purdue fans expected to get. Yeah, the family legacy, the hometown kid, never able to you know make a lot of visits because of the coronavirus pandemic. So to, to have to wait till signing day was, I'm sure, frustrating for Purdue fans. But he's the top-ranked kid in this class, and it's not even close. The, he's a 5.8 uh, four-star prospect. The next highest commitment in this class is a 5.6 mid-three-star prospect. So, like you mentioned, the low numbers, but also it's not a lot of, you know, the, the quality isn't as high as certainly Purdue fans expected, I'm sure. Yeah, and that's a, obviously yeah, the work will is already at what well, we already have. Purdue already has commitments for 2022. That has begun. Overall impressions of guys that uh, that you've seen uh, in, the, in this class and some comments, you know, obviously Yanni Karloftis, but to others that have been in your region and you're under your uh, watchful eye that uh, have made an impression on you. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, Yanni is the big name. He's the headliner. Is he ranked where he is just because he's George's brother, just because, you know, that, you know, he gets a benefit of the doubt? No, we rank each of these kids on their own merits. Yanni is a very long and rangy linebacker. I've seen him multiple times in multiple settings. I've seen him head to head with some of the best linebackers in the country. The only concern I have is he needs to bulk up, strengthen up, didn't get a chance to play senior season. And so we're going to, you know, essentially be two years out from the last time we've seen him, uh, you know, strap it up on the field when he comes to Purdue here and, you know, start, you know, when the fall season starts next year. So that's my concern. He probably doesn't impact immediately like George did because of that. But long term, he's a very talented linebacker. You know, you look at offensive line and all teams uh, want to be the next Wisconsin, I guess. And Purdue has struggled in that area under Jeff Brom. I think it's getting a little bit better. Uh, a little bit hard to tell this year, but uh, Purdue gets three uh, offensive linemen uh, from the Midwest. Uh, Amani Musa, Zach Richards uh, are two of them, and and um, and then the late late commitment from Marcus. And I've always mis mispronounced it, Mabau. Tell us about what you know about those three, and and just that overall emphasis on offensive line play, and the importance of that for Jeff Brom and company. Yeah, offensive line is the one area where I think they did hit their needs in terms of numbers. Um, each of these guys has, you know, none of these guys is a total all-around prospect. Each of them have questions. With Imbau, he's a very athletic kid, you know, doesn't play strong at the point of attack. He needs to kind of, you know, he's, he's a guy that needs a little bit of a nasty streak added to his game. I think he can be pretty good. Muhammad A. Musa, you know, plays like an offensive tackle, but Height-wise, size-wise, length-wise is probably better suited for offensive guard. But again, good athleticism. Zach Richards, not the athleticism you're looking for, brings a little bit more of that toughness. But actually, I think the guy that may have the, the highest upside, but also maybe the lowest floor, is Jalen Allstott Vandeventer, yes, and who I, was and their first commitment in the class. And tons of potential there. I don't think we got a chance to see 
his senior film before we went to rankings meetings last time. So he might be reevaluated here in January, but he's a guy who you can see some raw talent there, but he's raw is kind of the word I guess I was looking for in terms of what is the, you know, the holdup with him, how developed is he, how close is he to his ultimate potential? What's going to take to get him there. So numbers wise, good job. Um, You know, each of these guys has a chance but they're all going to have to kind of answer a question or two before they really uh, become starters for Purdue's offensive line. Yeah, and, and obviously, all Scott Vanderveen Van uh, uh an early commitment guy that uh, we've also seen during uh, during uh, uh, COVID and and watched him play a little bit. So that is a you know you get you get four guys actually in the offensive line, and that's going to that, that is a, I think a very positive development of this class. Deion Burks, Belleville, Michigan. Uh, uh, Purdue has been known as getting wide receivers. They get they got two, uh, I believe it is in this class, and Preston Terrell also, uh, and and Drew Biber at tight end. But uh, tell us what you what you know about those guys and your overall impressions if, if you've had a chance to see those guys face to face. Yeah, well, when you consider the wide receiver recruiting that Purdue has done the last couple of years, this group is not on par with that. I mean, these are serviceable guys. I think, you know, if they reach their potential, they're guys that can contribute to a wide receiver core. I don't see any of them leading a wide receiver core like uh, a Rondell Moore or like a David Bell. Um, it, this is not, yeah, this is not even, you know, Malik Carr, um, you know, Yassine, um, now I'm not forgetting his name, Akhtar Raham Akhmar. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I know him very well. I know his dad very well. So he's number two. Very upset yeah, with me. Yeah. I yeah. always pronounce his dad was always very happy. I pronounced his name correctly too. Um, yeah, so yeah, then yeah, see, he I know and I forget yeah. about. Him. Yeah, but um, but go ahead. Sorry. It's, so it's not on par with those you know with those classes. Uh, Burks is a speedy guy. You know, maybe not quite on the Marcellus Moore level of speed, but who is? Uh, but he he has that ability to be in the slot. Preston Terrell, bigger guy. And I was talking with Brian the other day about is he does he have the ability to separate consistently? That's what you always ask for with those big wide receivers. We got a chance to see him at the All American Combine, which you know you go against a lot of top uh, defensive backs in that group, and he didn't really pop in that setting. So I do have concerns whether he's going to be able to separate consistently at the next level. But you know, obviously, you know that's a that's a position group where they are very solid. I don't think any of these guys are going to be needed to contribute early or immediately, uh, but down the road, you know, several of them could be serviceable. Yeah. Purdue, obviously, yesterday being a Thursday, made the, Jeff Brown made the announcement that uh, they parted ways with Bob Diaco, defensive coordinator. Uh, I know you have an opinion on, on who somebody that might be a really good prospect, but also just talk about that in recruiting. Uh, I know it's it's done all the time where you have a you make an announcement staffing changes sometimes the day after a signing day but uh, tell us what you see that impact is with Purdue and what Purdue might need to do uh, if you're Jeff Braun to uh, fill that void. Yeah I don't think Purdue's recruits in this 2021 class are too shocked by that even talking with Yanni Karloftis earlier this week before he signed he kind of sounded like he anticipated that that development. So I, I don't, when you, when you talk about recruiting, obviously these guys build their relationships more with the position coaches than they do right. with the head coach. So those guys who Diaco recruited specifically that, that, you know, it probably hurts, you know, stings them a little bit not to have that guy that they built a relationship with there. Uh, but long-term, I don't think it's a, a problem, especially because it's not like he was that dynamic of a recruiter. He's not a name I heard a lot about. And, What's interesting is when I heard about that and I, because I've been so involved with signing week and the early signing period, I haven't had a chance to really follow up, you know, cover, follow all the coverage of it, but immediately one name sprang to mind. And that's Marcus Freeman, Marcus Freeman, former linebacker coach at Purdue, one of the most dynamic recruiters in the Midwest, if not the entire country, one of the top up and coming coaches. I thought he should have got a strong look for the Illinois head coaching job. And maybe he did, but if I'm Purdue, I spend a lot of money on Marcus Freeman, bring him back to West Lafayette. Obviously you look at what he's done with that Cincinnati defense number, you know, top 10 team when has Cincinnati ever been a top 10 football program, but he also the obviously what I, you know, cover and what I know best, he is a dynamic recruiter. He is an outstanding recruiter. He has 
strong ties throughout the region. Uh, he's going to be able to lift your recruiting from day one, and I suspect lift your defensive performance as well. And we had the opportunity to be around Marcus. He is a uh, he is the kind of guy you want to be around. He just has that personality. Uh, not surprised that uh, that uh, he's done well at Cincinnati. And uh, you're right, he'll get a head coaching job uh, sooner than later. And, and I think he'll do well with it because he's got that great magnetic personality. Interesting. And I uh, uh, appreciate your comments on that because uh, he would be an interesting one. And, and yet, you know, the Bra Jeff Brom uh, didn't necessarily go with a relationship with when he hired Bob Diaco uh that that we were readily aware of so it's it's really going to be interesting to see where uh he where he's <laughs> excuse me where he's able to land and uh, how important do you see that does it matter you know obviously 2022 is uh, upon us now uh from a recruiting standpoint Purdue's already got a couple of commitments but what um, is it important to, to fill this quickly uh, does it really matter in the short term no, I, I think it's more important to make sure you do it the right way. Uh, you have, like you mentioned, signing period. You've signed your 14 guys. Uh, 2022, you've got your quarterback. You've got a defense. You've got a linebacker. So you've you've got off to a start in 2022. Things will start to ramp up in January for that 2022 recruiting. February, if it follows the normal time frame, which, yeah. you know, who knows? I mean, <laughs> knows? we have no idea what's going to look like. But certainly, now that the early signing period's done, uh, 2022 recruiting will start to people teams will start to implement their 2022 recruiting game plan next month so you know i mean as long as you're not waiting two months to name your defensive coordinator uh i think you've got some time here you've got several weeks make sure you get the right person in in that position have you had a chance to see brady allen or at all in in, in your travels and, and if so i know you've written uh, about 2022 prospects but what, what's your what's your impression there uh, can't be more than more impressed with Brady Allen. Just from uh, initially the first time I met him, he was a freshman. Uh, it was at the best of the Midwest camp, which was almost two years ago now, uh, down in Indianapolis. And I got a chance to just talk with him as a freshman. How many freshmen look you in the eye, shake your hand, and just have that confidence about him, not cockiness, confidence about him to be able to have that type of conversation just extremely impressed with his poise his maturity at a young age and obviously he's got a big league arm uh, he's a guy that when you look at him physically he he absolutely looks like a division one quarterback is supposed to look tall strong I think he is a, a dynamic pickup for Purdue to start that class you when you start your class with your quarterback the, so many more things fall into place. So uh, the missteps that they made are made in this 2021 class. You have to have a lot more optimism for 2022 simply by starting it off with a talent like Brady Allen, that quarterback. What do you think Purdue will have to fend others off for him? I mean, it, it's always the case in today's world. Uh, obviously, he's a kid that uh, is becoming a may become a, a more of a national prospect. Will that be a challenge for Jeff Brom and company? Uh, this question is almost rhetorical, I understand, because it's always a challenge. But uh, tell me what to, uh, what may lay ahead uh, in terms of his long-term look uh, from from uh, Brady Allen perspective. You know, I always thought if Notre Dame came through and offered, they would be the team to beat for Brady. Uh, if that happened in the future, I could see that maybe maybe he you know takes a second look. But he knew what was out there. He knew the yeah. opportunities. I don't I don't expect this was not like Brady. Uh, was using Purdue as a placeholder just to have a spot to go that no he he did his research he's been recruited for a long time he knew the landscape and I think he picked the school that he felt was best for him so I I don't think that this I don't think Purdue fans should be more nervous about him than they would be about any other early commitment talk about you know 20 you know the crazy year of 2020 but there was something written uh, about if 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 you were a 2022 prospect and had an offer commit now the landscape because you know visits are still going to be hard to come by here in the near term uh just because of covid but what that has done to recruiting and what that will do in the short term and maybe even in the long term uh, from your perspective we were already looking at a very probably muted 2022 recruiting cycle in terms of how many offers went out how many kids committed i have heard from mid-major schools that expect to sign single digit classes yeah. that's that's 
I mean, I, I don't even know how to comprehend that considering what we've been through over the last, I mean, remember back at Ole Miss would sign 37 kids in a single class. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 person classes. That's, that's going to be tough to deal with. And that I saw that article, or I at least saw the headline for that article yeah. and immediately agreed with it. If you're a 2022 guy, if my son is a class of 2022 recruit, and he has an offer that he feels fits him, I'd, I'd go on it right away. Uh, we, I think the, the announcement earlier this week plays into that as much as anything by the NCAA, which announced that transfers will be immediately eligible. That's going to up the ante in the transfer portal. There are going to, when you have guys that you know you can plug in immediately and don't have to sit out, don't have to try to get a waiver for, you're going to be more apt to be active in the transfer market. And so I think the stock of everybody in that transfer portal just went up and you have to have a counter uh, move and that's going to be in high school recruiting where and junior college recruiting to be honest too i think they'll take a big hit but uh as you're you can only bring in 25 initial qualifiers that's high school prospects that's juco recruits that's transfers that's a guy you put on scholarship for the first time who was maybe a walk-on on your team that 25 initial qualifier number is a very restrictive number so every time you grab a transfer or you know you you bring people in other than the traditional high school football recruiting route, that's going to take spots away from those types of recruits. Yeah, interesting thing and an interesting development because of, and you, you add into the fact that all the all the seniors uh, or everybody basically gets a free year in terms of eligibility. Uh, I don't uh, envy these coaches in terms of uh, trying to figure out which end is up. Does that, and, and the last question for you, does that just put more of a premium also on making you know, stating the obvious here, maybe but making sure you make the right evaluation, you get the right guy that's going to fit you and a guy that might stick with you. Sure. And, and obviously look at from a coaching standpoint, we talk about how tough it was for recruits. They weren't able to take official visits, meet the coaches in person since March from a recruiting, from a recruiter standpoint, they're not able to bring these kids onto their campus, size them up, look at them physically, uh, make, you know, see their growth potential, their their frame, their bone structure, how they're going to fill out, what's going to happen if you put weight on them. You didn't have a summer camp to be able to get your hands on these kids, see their movement skills up close. It, it, obviously, it has made the evaluator's job a lot more difficult. So that may, you know, that may be playing into why there's low numbers in 2022 also. But yeah, I mean, you have to be able to hit on a higher percentage, yet you have less resources to be able to evaluate correctly going to be an interesting interesting time we look forward to your coverage we appreciate your coverage in terms of goldenblack.com and what you try to bring to the table we're we're uh, grateful for that so josh have a good holiday uh, but merry christmas to you and your family and uh, we'll look forward to having you on again we I, I think this uh, uh, there's a lot still to discuss in recruiting all right we want to thank uh, gordon jackson and Scott Sumner and the group at, at uh, WLFI for all they do. I want to thank our sponsors, Hilton Garden Inn, Triple X, and State Farm agent Trent Johnson. We will not have a show until, because the next two Fridays, Christmas Day and New Year's Day, we'll spare you our show till January the 8th, but we'll be back for more on Golden Black Live. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great holiday, and uh, stay safe. Thanks so much.